Uh, you may not know much about what we're doing when we work through the Advent scriptures, but essentially what happens is, is that lo- many of the larger traditional churches that are historic, been around for thousands of years, um, every year around this season, uh, they all go through the same scriptures. And there's two Old Testament scriptures, and there's two New Testament scriptures every Sunday. And what essentially they're doing in the Advent season is trying to connect the people of God universally around the world to the story of God. And how the story of God starts in the Old Testament and how it goes all the way to the last pages of the Bible. So we've been, work, we've been actually doing this for several years now. And each week we're working through the four scriptures for the Sunday trying to show the story of God from the past, to show it in the future, and then that gives us zeal for today. So we've kind of branded the series Back to the Future. Now, I've told you for several weeks now, that's not because it's my favorite time travel movie. Um, I actually haven't watched all the Back to the Futures. Um, I think they're a little cheesy and corny, so they're not really my favorite. Um, Terminator would be the one that I would, uh, my my time travel movie would be the one I'd be interested in. But, uh, but I can't call the series Terminator, so we'll call it Back to the Future um, because, we're, you know, they wouldn't let me do that. We're not youth group anymore. Um, but here's the big idea. The big idea is that God has done something in the past that we can look at. And when we look back at what he's done in the past, and then we look ahead to what he's done in the future, it gives us zeal and purpose for how we walk out our lives now. And that's the big idea of every time travel movie, isn't it? Like that somehow the past is connected to the future. That somehow if you could travel into the future and you could see what's about to happen, you could see how your, all your choices would work out, then maybe you would live differently. Or if you could go back in the past and you could see how grandma and grandpa and, and how it was done back in the Civil War, and somehow you'd see what was going on in the past, then you would realize, hey, we can learn from our mistakes or we would learn what we're going to do in the present. And in some way, there's actually a really deep biblical truth to that where the Bible is constantly saying, look back. Look back at the faithfulness of God. Look back at the promises of God. Look back at how the people of God have walked with God. And then it always continues to say, look forward. Look forward to what God's gonna do. God's working. God is doing something in the universe. And as we look forward to what he's going to do, then the writers of the Bible always say, therefore, this is how you live. Living in light of what he's done, living in light of what he's going to do, gives us purpose and zeal for how we live today. So we've walked through a couple things over these last few weeks. The first week, the readings took us to this idea that the king, that the coming king, establishes the house. And the house is just the way the Bible talks about the people of God. So you're the house. In fact, in 1 Peter, it says, you're a rock. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a rock. You're a stone, it says, and God put the house together using you as stones, and Jesus is the cornerstone. So he's the foundational stone, and then he builds people into this house continually to build this house. And what it said in the Old Testament, in Psalms, it said that he gathers the nations, and that the nations are like rivers that flow to the house, and that the house is built on the mountain of God. The mountain of God is the presence of God. So here's what we learned in week one, that God's building a house. And he's building a house to gather the people back to his presence. Because that's the problem with rebellion. Human rebellion scattered the people from the presence of God. It scattered us away from God, and God in his work is gathering the peoples back to his presence. So he's building a house. And the question is, if he's building a house, he started a house with Israel and he's building a house that's gonna come in the future, and we are the house now, what are the people of God supposed to be doing? Supposed to be building the house. We're in the house, we're part of the house, and we build the house. How do we build the house? By encouraging one another, by loving one another, by teaching one another, by holding each other accountable, by challenging one another to walk in the ways of Jesus. We build the house. So he built the house, he's building the house, we are the house, and we build the house, and that was week one. Week two was the king establishes justice, and justice is kind of a dirty word in our culture because it assumes that there's a judge. But here's the reality. Anytime we look out in the world and we see oppression, we see children oppressed, we see the poor oppressed, we see vulnerable peoples oppressed, we all go, hey, we hope that there is someone with the power to enact justice. 
And so when we look at the king, the promise of the king is that he shows up on a planet where there's lots of oppression, and he says, enough. Now, the needy children are not going to be oppressed anymore. The poor that can't afford a lawyer, not going to be oppressed anymore. The king establishes justice. And what gives him the right to establish justice? He's the only one who's ever walked the planet who's righteous. So you have to be righteous to enact justice. And you're not righteous, and I'm not righteous. Jesus is righteous, and he comes with the full wisdom and power of God, and so he establishes justice. And so what do the people of God do? If we saw that he established justice in the Old Testament, and he's going to ultimately establish justice in the future, what do the people of God do today? Well, first of all, we see the righteous king, and we do what John says to do. We repent, because we're not righteous. None of us are. So the righteous king shows up on the planet, and John says, there he is. Repent. Turn away. Give up your life. Lay down your life. You're a rebel. Turn to Jesus. So the people of God see the righteous king, and we repent. And then we see what the righteous king is doing. What's he doing? He's fighting for oppressed people. And so what do we do? We fight for oppressed people. We lean into the injustices of the world as a king who's establishing justice has put us on a mission as agents of his justice. And so we saw that the king establishes justice. Last week, my buddy Mike was here, and Mike talked about how the king restores what was broken. The king restores what is broken. So we saw in Isaiah 35, for example, that when the king shows up, the king is going to make the blind see again. He's going to make the lame walk again. He's going to be, be, end with all droughts, all these droughts that are killing crops. Done with that. Finished. The lion's going to sleep with the lamb, and war is going to be finished with. He's going to restore what is broken. And here was the really, I don't know if you caught this last week, but this was the really cool thing about last week. John the Baptist knows who Jesus is. He's filled with the Holy Spirit from when he's a baby. So he knows that Jesus is the Messiah. He sees Jesus healing the blind, healing the lame, preaching the gospel to the poor. And then John gets thrown in prison and he dies there. He's not rescued. He's not delivered. His head is cut off in prison. And while he's waiting for his head to get cut off in prison, and he's been preaching about a king who restores what was lost, a king who restores what was broken, a king that makes the lame walk and the blind see, and, and he, he knows this is the king, and he's watching him do that stuff, and all of a sudden, he's in prison, and his head's about to come off, and he has what any normal person would have, doubt. I mean, come on. If you don't have doubt at that moment, you're not human. So he's in prison, and he's got doubt. He knows he's going to die, and he sends his guys to Jesus. And he says, hey, can you ask that guy this question? Can you ask him, are you really the one we're waiting for? Because here's the logic. If Jesus is the one you're waiting for, there's no way he's going to let this guy cut my head off. If Jesus is the guy we're waiting for, there is no way he's going to let me suffer like this. He'll never let me go through this. He'll never let it in this way. That can't be. I'm preaching about a king who makes all things right in the world. There's no way it ends like this for me. And Jesus sends his guys back, and he says, hey, tell John this. What do you see me doing? The blind see, the lame walk, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And John dies in prison. Because Jesus is working on a bigger canvas than John's short life. He's working on a bigger thing than even human history. And so John preaches about a Jesus who restores everything. And so that's what we've been looking at over these last three weeks. The king who establishes the house, the king who establishes justice, and the king who restores what is broken. And today the readings take us to this big idea is the king has come to save. The king has come to save. I want to show you this in the first reading in Psalms. I love this passage. It's awesome. Psalms 80. Check out what it says in Psalms 80, verse 1. It says, give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Now, this is David talking to God. So he recognizes that God is his shepherd. David said that before. 
So he says, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph, and that would be, that's the patriarch, right? So he's saying the family of God, you lead the family of God like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherub. Shine forth, shepherd. Shine forth, king, is what he's saying. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, before our family, stir up your might and what? And come to save us. So here's this thing. King David is suffering. His people are suffering. And he looks up and he says, Shepherd, you said we're your flock. You said you're our, we're, we're your people. You said you're going to watch over us and you're going to care for us and that we're special to you. Shine and rescue. Shine and rescue. Restore us, O oh God, that your face may shine, that we may be saved. That's a cool little phrase there. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. There's something that you're going to find if you ever read the Old Testament from beginning to end. There's this idea about the presence of God and the face of God. And the reason that is is because they're actually the same word in Hebrew. Because for Hebrew, your face turned toward someone was your presence and your favor turned toward them. This is why if you go back in Exodus, uh, Moses wants to be in the presence of God. I don't know if you remember this. And Moses has got the people, and they're being punks, and they're being critical. And so he goes up in the mountain, and he's like, hey, uh, God, I just need to know that you're going to go with me. I know you're going to talk to me. Will you be with me? Can I see your face? And in Hebrew, it's, I want to be in your presence. And so you'll see in Exodus 34, the writer, the, the translations go back and forth from presence to face, presence to face, because they mean the same thing. And here's what David's trying to say. God, turn your face toward me. Come close to me. Now, if you've never been in a place in your life where the cry of your heart in the back part of your room or somewhere on your shower floor or somewhere at your workplace, if you've never had the cry of your heart be, God, could you please come close? Could you please be near? Could your face shine toward me? You know, there have been times where... Um, the best way I could pray that prayer was, God, would you be kind to me? Like, I just need to know you're going to be kind. Like, I, I need to know you're going to be close. I, I need to know that your face toward me is good, that your face isn't turned away from me, that you're not blind to me, that you're not ignoring me, that you're not far away from me, that your favor is toward me, that your face is toward me. And he connects the face of God and the favor of God, the presence of God, to being rescued. Because that's what it means to be rescued by God. It's not that he would solve all your financial problems. It's not that he would solve all your health problems on this planet. It's not that he would rescue you from any kind of loneliness or any other kind of suffering you could think of. The rescue that God provides is a rescue that says, you are far off and I want you to be close. You didn't know my favor. You didn't know my presence. You didn't know my face was on you and I want to gather you back. I want you to see me. I want you to know me. I want you to experience my tender mercy over your life. And so David calls out for that. He says, would your face be toward me? Would it shine that we might be saved? Oh, Lord God of angels' armies, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? So what is that? What he's saying is, is we're talking to you, God, and it seems like you're far off. We're praying to you, God. We're calling on your name, and it seems like you're nowhere close to us. If you haven't experienced this, you may not have walked the planet for very long. But if you have walked the planet for very long, you've gone through moments in your life and in your journey with God where your prayers go up, and it seems like the face of God isn't turned toward you. And you're going, God, come on. Like, come on, listen to my prayers. Turn your face toward me. Don't you see where I'm at? Don't you see what I'm going through? He says, but you fed them with the bread of tears, and you've given them tears to drink in full measure. You made us the object of contention of our neighbors. In other words, our neighbors look in and they go, what's wrong with you guys? And our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of angels' armies. Let your face shine. Let your favor be close, essentially. Let your presence be near that we might be saved. And then check out how he ties this in, because this is all about Jesus, and here's the, how the writer's gonna tell you that. Look at verse 17. 
but let your hand be on the man of your right hand. Now, who are we talking to? Remember, we're talking about the shepherd who sits on the throne. That's how it all started. You're the shepherd who sits on the throne. So and here's what we want then. We want your hand, God, the shepherd who sits on the throne, to be on the man of your right hand. So obviously you're sitting on a throne somewhere, and you got a man on your right hand. We want your hand to be on him. And who is this man? The son of man, whom you have made strong for yourself, that we should not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord, of angels' armies. Let your face shine that we might be saved. David's saying, there's a rescue coming. And I don't know where God is right now, and I don't know what he's doing on planet Earth. I don't know how he's working through it all. I don't see it. I don't know it. I don't know if I can hear his voice, and I don't even know If he cares, but I want to know that his eyes are toward me, that his face is shining toward me, and then my hope is in a man. My hope is that there is a son of man. There is someone sitting on the right hand of God in heaven. Would you make him strong so he can bring the rescue? We're looking back because the prophet is saying, look forward. There is a rescue coming I want you to see this in Isaiah. You know, the the second scripture in the Old Testament flips us to Isaiah 7. And Isaiah 7 is an amazing, amazing scripture. And we're going to see a very, very famous line in Isaiah 7. But before I want you to see that line, I want you to, to know what's going on. As we fast forward to Isaiah, Isaiah is 700 years before the birth of Jesus. 700 years before Jesus is born on the planet, Isaiah speaks. And he's speaking in a really weird situation, okay? Just so you know, the verse I'm about to read to you, like it's all all our Christmas songs, it was not like written in a Christmas song. It was written in a war, okay, just so you know. And here was what was happening. Basically, uh, the Jewish people had rebelled against God, so God split the kingdom. And there was Israel and there was Judah. And Israel wasn't really following God. Judah was was the house of David. It was the line of David. And they were kind of following God, but their king was kind of a... Ah, how do you say it? He was kind of a wimp. And he's kind of afraid, okay? So what happened was Israel, okay, they decided that they were going to attack Judah. So they went and got Syria. It's another bad country. They were like terrible, and they were like warring peoples. And so they got together. Syria and Israel is going to attack Jerusalem. And so this king of Judah, I can't say his name right. Let's see here. His name is Hazaz. Maybe that's right. A-H-A-Z. Um, he decides he's going to go pay money to, to Assyria. So you got Syria and Assyria, and he's going to go pay money for them to fight and protect them. And God shows up, and he goes, what are you doing? And he goes, well, we, I mean, these people are going to attack us. And he goes, well, what are you doing? And he goes, but they're going to attack us. And I, I got money. I'm going to get this other army to help us. And he goes, what are you doing, God says. You don't need the help of some foreign army. You've got the Lord on your side. What is your problem? And and so the prophet Isaiah, by the mouth of God, says, hey, listen, test me. I'll give you a sign. I'll test me. God's going to come through for you. And the king refuses to ask God for a sign. He says, no, I, I got my own plan. I got my own plan. And then we get to one of the most famous verses of the Old Testament. 7 verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. What? If you're the king, this makes no sense. You're in Jerusalem. You're being besieged. In our day and age, bullets are flying over your head. You're crumbling around you. The armies of two nations are coming in on your city, and the God who's supposed to protect you says, hey, listen, you're going to be protected. There's a woman who's never going to have sex, and she's going to have a baby. What? Huh? (laughs) It makes, like, no sense. And here's the scary thing. It wasn't fulfilled for 700 years. Not fulfilled for 700 years, which means those armies came and fought. That guy never trusted in God coming through for them. He paid for the Assyrian army. 
The Assyrian army helped them win that day, and you know what the Assyrian army did to them? They took them over. They captured them. They ruled them. And not for 700 years did God come through on his promise. That means no one who heard the initial promise of God ever saw it on the planet. We cannot make the litmus test for God's faithfulness our short lifetime. Or some of us, we've made the litmus test of his faithfulness this year. Like, I'm done with God. He didn't come through for me this year. I'm done, I'm done with God. He, he, I lost my job. Things went bad for me. That relationship didn't work. Things fell apart in my family. I'm done with God. God's going, what are you talking about? This year is not the litmus test of my faithfulness. The last month is not the standard that I'm going to be judged on in human history for whether I've been good to you. God's faithfulness and his story is on a much bigger canvas. It has much more to do with what's going on in human history and eternity than our short days on this planet. But the wild thing is our connection to God depends on our trusting him that he's still writing that story. Trusting him that whether we feel his favor now, he's still writing the story. Whether this last year was a good year or a bad year, he's still writing the story. If he can be faithful after 700 years of a prophecy about a virgin and a rescue coming that no one who ever heard it ever saw, then surely he can be faithful to us in whatever we're going through. And so he, he says, this is going to happen. And they never see it for 700 years. And then Matthew, probably 50 years after Jesus has risen from the dead at the cross, writes what we all know to be the Christmas story. And here's what he says. After telling us that Jesus comes from the line of David, here's what he says. He says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child. Scandal. Come on, have you ever read that with real scandal? Like, I'm sure when you read to your kids the Christmas story, you didn't stop and go, um, hold on a second. You got a baby. You're not married yet. Um, what's, going, what's, go, what's going on here? Like, this is not how we think through the Christmas story. There is real scandal here. But Joseph's a just man, and he's unwilling to put her to shame. So he resolves to divorce her quietly. I want you to know, it's very strategic for Matthew to show you this. Matthew is the writer of the New Testament that's always trying to... T- show Jews how Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And Matthew is pointing all the way back to Genesis because the story of the gospel starts with God making it all right and perfect and amazing. And then men and women, we rebel against God. And what's the result? Shame. They were naked and they were unashamed when God created them. When they rebelled, they had shame. And they ran and they hid. And what happens at the very beginning of the birth? Shame's in the story. And Joseph says, that's not the journey. We're not pushing into shame. Shame always drives us to hide. Shame always drives us to avoid. And even here, even though Mary hasn't done anything wrong, shame is still part of the story. And yet Joseph says, I don't want to shame her. And he considered these things, and behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which was conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call him Jesus, for he will what? He will save his people from their sins. The answer to shame is not to embrace our brokenness and say everything's okay. That's what the culture would love us to do. The answer to shame is not to go, well, there's nothing wrong that you could do. Just make your choices, live your life, do it. Our own minds won't let us do that. 
As much as we try to accept what it is we want to do with our lives, our own mind, our own, our own bodies won't let us do this. And we kind of rebel against it. And whether we want to or not, shame comes rushing into the story. Now, the only answer is a rescue. So religion comes to shame. Religion comes to say, hey, you dirty, dirty person. How could God ever accept you? Go run and hide until you clean up. And Jesus shows up and says, it is a broken world. You need a rescue. You need to be brought close. You need to be forgiven. The answer to shame-based religion is not to embrace our brokenness. It's to look for the rescue of Jesus. That's what we need. And so we hear Isaiah's words in Matthew. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. What did David say in Psalms 80? Would your face shine toward me? Would your presence be with me? Oh, God, you're not hearing my prayers. You seem far off. What's the cry of my heart? Would you come close? And what's the promise from the prophet in Isaiah 700 years before? Hey, there is a rescue coming. God, Emmanuel, is coming close. And Matthew says this is the Messiah. This is the Jewish king prophesied. And he's going to restore us back to his presence. What was lost in the fall is restored through the king. And, J- and Joseph woke from his sleep, and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took his wife, but he did not know her till she had given birth to a son, and she called his name Jesus. Do you guys see what the story of God is? It's so much bigger than this year, than these last few days, and even bigger than our own life. It's so much bigger because God is working in the world to restore everything that's been lost. And he rescues and he saves through the king, the righteous king who came as a baby and laid down his life. And so we go to our last reading, and we're going to move to the table here in a second. The band can get ready to come back up. But if the prophet said the king is coming... Then the king came, fulfilled the prophecy, and if the end of the page, the end of the story of the Bible is that he's coming again to finish the work, to establish eternity, if that's true, then what do we do as people who see that we were rescued from shame, that we were rescued from brokenness, that we've been brought back near to the face and favor and the presence of God through the work of Jesus, if that's us, then what do we do? And here's what Paul tells us, and this is the last reading of our Advent season. Paul tells us this in Romans 1. He says, I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. I'm called to be an apostle. I'm set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised, what, beforehand through the prophets in the holy scriptures. In other words, I'm looking back. I'm looking back to what he promised. Here's what happened. It was all concerning his son, who was descendant from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness. What? From his resurrection from the dead. The incarnation, the virgin birth is the echo, is the front runner, is the foreshadowing of the resurrection. Every bit of the gospel is something only God can do. This is why it blew the king's mind when he heard, what's the rescue of God? A virgin birth. Huh? That has nothing to do with human strength. And the incarnation comes, nothing to do with human strength. And the resurrection comes, and nothing to do with human strength. Our rescue has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with what God is doing. And so he says, he came, and he was declared to be God through the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the what? For the sake of his name among the nations, including you. So not just the apostle Paul, 
including you, Lloyd, including you, Davis, for the sake of his name among the nations, you and I have received grace. So if God's bigger than our little story, if God's working on a canvas bigger than my own life, then why the heck do I exist? Why am I standing on this stage? Why are we here on planet Earth if God's story is bigger than me? It's for the sake of his name among the nations. It's for the sake of his name among the nations. So that we play a part in God gathering the nations back to himself. Until the end of the day when he recreates the heavens and the earth. And we live with him forever. We live for the sake of his name until he finishes what he wants to accomplish in our lives. So we're going to move to the table in a second. And as we do, let's reflect on what God is doing in this story. God, we come to you. Now we're so small. And yet we're distinctly aware that we belong to you. And we're distinctly aware that you're kind toward us. And we're distinctly aware that we cannot fix ourselves, but that you have worked to restore us. And you are working even now to do everything you promised to do. And so because of that, we worship you.